human nature, act human psychology, is a necessary first step to put us in a position to be able to evaluate it, to be able to question it, to be able to look at what social practices are to be praised in light of that underlying nature. Um, okay. Section 7, um, in some ways, looks like, well, in some ways is, um, a kind of aside to the um, story here. Um, but it's important and hints at how guilt, the moral notion of guilt, is eventually going to emerge. It has not yet emerged. Uh, section 7. Um, top of page 44. He says, what actually arouses indignation against suffering is not suffering itself, but rather the senselessness of suffering. But neither for the Christian, who has interpreted into suffering an entire secret salvation machinery. This is going to be, that, that's sort of anticipating story of the moralization of suffering. This is going to anticipate the origin of guilt there. Let's start over. But neither for the Christian who has interpreted into suffering the entire secret salvation machinery, nor for the naive human of older times who knew how to interpret all suffering in terms of spectators or agents of suffering, was there any such meaningless suffering at all. So what really troubles us is not our suffering, but the idea that we're suffering for no purpose, that there's no meaning or redemption to our suffering. So, for both Christians and for, he says, uh, naive humans of older times, there must be someone or something witnessing our suffering and witnessing our virtue so that it's not meaningless. So that concealed, he says, undiscovered, unwitnessed suffering could be banished from the world and honestly negated. One was almost compelled back then to invent gods and intermediate beings of all heights and depths. In short, something that also roams in secret, that also sees in the dark and that does not easily let an interesting, painful spectacle escape it. So, in addition to having someone observe someone or something, either God or gods, observing, being omniscient, seeing your suffering so that there's a point to it, in addition to that, they have to be able to look, so to speak, into your soul into who you really are, to see your suffering, so that you have a point. Um, so, line 30 on 44. So just as there needed to be someone to, watching, to be watching in order to abolish meaningless suffering, so too, he says, Virtue, without witnesses, was something entirely inconceivable for the people of spectacles. Uh, wasn't that, so this is like the Greeks. So wasn't that the philosopher's invention, so audacious, so faithful, which was first devised for Europe back then? That of free will, of the absolute spontaneity of man in good and evil, devised above all in order to create a right to the idea that the interest of the gods in man in human virtue could never be exhausted. Okay, so free the idea of free will. So this free will is a metaphysical idea. And so for Nietzsche, it means it's a projection of values. So free will is invented or emerges so that gods or God have something to evaluate and assess in, in us continuously. So 
So God is always observing your soul. God always knows um, what you are choosing. God always knows your maxims of action, you might say. Okay, so this is a kind of aside that is hinting at the story of the moralization of this idea, but we're not there yet. Okay, um, so back now to the idea of the origin of uh, guilt in relation to buyers and sellers. Okay, so from the perspective of this relationship of having debts that need to be paid, debts that need to be extracted, um, we get the idea at the bottom of page 45. I want to arrive straight away, he says, at the grand generalization. Everything has its price. Everything can be paid off. So he says, this is the oldest and most naive moral canon of justice. He says, it's at the beginning of all good-naturedness, all fairness, all goodwill, all objectivity on earth. Um, justice, he says, at this first stage is the goodwill among parties approximately equal in power to come to terms with one another to reach an understanding again by means of the settlement. Um, and in regard to the less powerful parties, those who are unable to discipline themselves, who are unable to keep their promises, who are unable to pay their debts, to force them to a settlement among themselves. Okay, and now Nietzsche returns to something that I mentioned earlier that might surprise you in this context. He talks about the kind of idea of a social contract, the kind of idea now of the relationship between a creditor and a debtor, where the debtor is an individual and the creditor is society as a whole, the kind of contract made in exchange there. This is what he's saying. In section 9. This is the community too, the community as a whole. Thus stands to its members in that, in that important basic relationship, that of the creditor to the debtor. So the community itself stands in relation of community to the debtor. And look what he says, look carefully what he says here. One lives in a community, one enjoys the advantages of a community, so one benefits from that and is put in debt to the society. One lives in a community, one enjoys the advantage of the community. Oh, what advantages! Exclamation point. We sometimes underestimate this today. One lives protected, shielded, in peace and trust, free from care with regard to certain injuries and hostilities to which the human outside the community, outside the society, is exposed. The outlaw is exposed. Um, since one has pledged and obligated oneself to the community precisely in view of these injuries and hostility, what happens in the other case? The community, he says, so if one does not repay one's debt, what happens in that case? One has a, a, a debt to the community. The community, the deceived creditor, will exact payment as best it can. One can count on that. And then he describes the punishment, the extraction of a debt from the uh, individual who's violating the social contract is, at this stage, swift and extremely cruel. It involves treating that individual as an enemy, uh, as someone who is outside of any concern of the community. Um, and so really there's no limit to what can be inflicted on that individual. <coughs> okay. But here's what I was alluding to before. Look at the bottom of um, 47. He says, 
um, oh, sorry, it's the top of uh, the, the beginning section. Yeah. So, but now think about a community getting more powerful, stronger. As its power grows, he says, the community no longer takes the transgressions of the individual so seriously because they can no longer count as dangerous and subversive for the continued existence of the whole to the same extent as formerly. Okay, so initially, when we have a kind of shaky foundation for society, where the community itself is not strong, where individual violations of the social contract really might put the community in jeopardy. Extracting a debt from violators is cruel and brutal. But now as the community gets stronger, the failure to repay the debt that is a violation of the social contract really does not endanger the community as a whole anymore. I just said, as it gets stronger, it's not imperiled by violations as much. The evildoer, therefore, is no longer made an outlaw and cast out. The general anger is no longer allowed to vent itself on this, in the same unbridled manner as formerly. Rather, from now on, the evildoer is carefully defended against this rage is the rage of the other members of the community who are seeking to vent their power on him. Particularly, the evil who is carefully defended against this anger, particularly that of the ones directly injured, and is taken under the protection of the whole. So the thought is, again, that as society becomes stronger, um, a strong society is not going to be as harmed by transgressions of the social contract. Um, and so is going to protect the violator from these cruel and brutal impositions by the members of the society, members of the community, especially the particular individuals who are wrong. It would not be impossible to imagine a consciousness of power in society such that the society might allow itself the noblest luxury there is for it. Right, so now we're imagining like a society that's at its peak of power and stability, unthreatened by violators of the social contract. Such a society might allow itself the noblest luxury there is for it, to leave the one who injures it unpunished. Quote, what concern are my parasites to me? It might then say. Let them live and prosper. I'm strong enough for that. The justice, he says, continuing, that began with, so the idea of justice, that began with the idea everything can be paid off, everything must be paid off, even through cruel inflictions of power over uh, the debtor, ends by looking the other way and letting the one unable to pay go free. It ends like every good thing on earth by canceling itself, by overcoming itself. This cancellation of justice, we know that, sorry, we know what pretty name it gives itself. This overcoming of justice whereby the strength of the community allows it to forgive debts that are owed to it. Mercy. As it goes without saying, it remains the privilege of the most powerful. Better still is beyond the law, he says. All right, so notice that the idea of um, justice evolves and changes over time, starting with a very strict and precise accounting and develops into something that overcomes that requirement.